Welcome back to On This Day in Jazz. Today is July 17th. Miles Davis' career is about to get a huge boost as he performs at the second annual Newport Jazz Festival on this date in 1955. 1955 started out as a rough year for jazz. The great Charlie Parker, the bebop icon, wonderful saxophonist, dies at the age of 34 in March. Now, Miles was going down a similar path chemically. He wasted about four years of his own life to heroin addiction. So let's step back and think of where Miles was in 1955. We usually think of Miles as this jazz icon, master of the music. Well, in 1955, he didn't have that reputation yet. He starts out playing with Charlie Parker as a teen when he gets to New York in the mid-40s. So a lot of those important Charlie Parker sides features a very young Miles Davis. So there he was at the top of the bebop tradition. He declines an offer to join Ellington's band after that, and he starts experimenting in the basement of, in Gil Evans' basement apartment with a bunch of other like-minded musicians, um, experimenting with different sounds, more influenced by classical chamber music in a sense, and also the arrangements that Gil Evans was working on with the Claude Thornhill band. So he organizes a nine-piece band. This included Jerry Mulligan and Lee Connitz, amongst others, with great arrangements by Jerry Mulligan and Gil Evans. And these recordings will later be known as the birth of the cool when they're finally compiled in the mid-50s. And around this time, he starts using heroin, and his life and his reputation is in a free fall. And not until he breaks this habit, spending time on his father's farm and living in Detroit for a little bit. By 1954, he is finally starting to beat this habit. And he records Walkin'. Check out the recording of Walkin'. And you hear a completely different Miles Davis. So this is the beginning of what we know as hard bop. So 1955, Miles was healthier than ever, bursting with ideas, playing better than ever. His recording of the previous years are getting a lot of excitement by musicians and a small following, but he's not even successful enough to have his own band. So what happens? 1955, the Newport Jazz Festival, with there's so many great moments in the Newport Jazz Festival. Next year, you're going to have the wonderful um, Duke Ellington performance that is iconic. Find that recording and check that out, especially Paul Gonzalez's, I think, 36 chorus solo. So in 1955, Miles Davis is really an afterthought to this. His name was added so late that he isn't even on the program. They put together an all-star band, and, um, Thelonious Monk, cool jazz saxophonist Zoot Sims, and Jerry Mulligan, bassist Percy Heath, and drummer Connie Hay of the Modern Jazz Quartet. The MC for this year is Duke Ellington, and if you check out the actual recording of this momentous 20-minute set, you will hear Duke Ellington introduce Miles Davis, introduce, uh, um, he will introduce Thelonious Monk as the High Priest of Bebop. Now both Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk are really struggling for money at the time which is strange for us thinking of how many records that we own of these people today. The band opens with a Thelonious Monk tune, Hack and Sack, and you hear Miles perform a mighty fine solo, and they close with a nod to Charlie Parker with his blues tune, Now's the Time, playing on all these is, is, is quite wonderful. But it's the middle tune 
that really stands out here. It's Monk's famous tune Round Midnight, where the magic really happens. And here you see Miles' command of melody, his command of tone, improvisational surprise. He's playing off this melody in such a wonderful way. And the way Miles puts it, he said, When I got off the bandstand, everybody looked at me like I was a king. Well, at the time, Miles was under contract with Prestige, and he had wanted to move to Columbia for a while now, knowing what he needed for his career is the resources of a major record company. And the A&R guy, George Avakian, was kind of resistant knowing that he was still under contract with Prestige, but he was at the festival with his brother who told him, don't be a fool, sign him. And so he works out a deal with Prestige, buys out the Prestige contract, but he's, Miles still owes five albums to Prestige. And so here Miles begins an extremely musically productive period. He records four albums in two marathon sessions, which is so strange thinking the way music is created today, how long it takes, how many producers, how many songwriters, and in two marathon sessions, four records, all of them classics, all of them worth listening to. Cooking, relaxing, working, steaming. And all these include Miles Davis's first great quintet, including John Coltrane. These are the first great solos we hear of John Coltrane. John Coltrane on tenor saxophone, Red Garland on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, and Philly Joe Jones on drums. And he also starts in 1955, his first album for Columbia, which will be Round About Midnight. Check out that amazing recording of Round Midnight from that recording, and you hear his signature Harmon mute sound, and just tremendous playing all around by the ensemble. 1955 was also an interesting year for Miles. In October, he had throat surgery to remove polyps. He was told to remain silent, but Miles got into an argument, which gave him that signature raspy voice, which he had for the rest of his life. So there you go. That's what happened on this date in 1955. Like us and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on This Day in Jazz.